here. But um, if you're joining us, glad to be here hanging out with Hannah Schlieff, good friend of mine. So do a little new thing we're calling Writer's Corner, um, just a chance for us to share a little bit about, uh, I guess, the process of writing and share some stories and that sort of thing. Because, you know, we've had a lot of videos on Bread for Beggars ever since the quarantine started. Um, we've just been doing a lot of cool things where people are sharing all kinds of awesome gifts. Um, we've got uh, Sarah and the Branches Band are doing, and uh, uh, Carolyn, I think is her name, who, all of them doing the children's programs. Those are awesome. Um, I've been watching those uh, a lot of the times that they're on and enjoying that a lot. And a lot of those guys who are sharing their playing hymns and songs and whatnot in the evenings, that's been really cool too. And, uh, and then you got... Jason Jasperson sharing his art, and then we Dan Jasperson sharing his magic. <laughs> but a uh, big part of Bread for Beggars is the story side of things, right? It's sharing God's glory through sight, song, and story. And, you know, Hannah, you and I were talking about the fact that um, writing is such a solitary process most of the time. Like, you don't, you like, even if you sat, you know, even if you got together with other writers, you'd be like sitting in a circle doing your own thing in your own head yeah <laughs> right it's not like making music where you can be like all right i'm gonna play this and maybe somebody else is gonna bounce some ideas or we're just gonna talk about it it's like very solitary so i i wanted to do this conversation as an opportunity to encourage those who are um in the writing zone those who like to write stories and and be creative in that way using words and just spend a little bit of time sharing some stuff and seeing where it goes. So if you are watching, we would definitely welcome you guys to chime in at any point, ask any questions you have or make any comments and we'll try and respond to you as we're able to do so. Uh, but before we do so, um, maybe just a little bit of quick introductions here. Um, I'm Brandon Steenbach and I've been writing with Bread for Beggars for quite a few years actually, back when we first started as a kind of devotional website. Uh, Luke Italiano and I were doing some different stuff, basing devotions on kind of some different writings and books and stuff. And then more recently started writing more as a, a story writer for Bread for Beggars. And Hannah, you got started with Bread for Beggars. Um, how yeah. long has it been since you got on board? Pretty recently. I would say it's been under a year um, and I have not been consistent with it. Um, but kind of whenever I have something finished, I send it out there. Um, so I've mostly done book reviews. Um, I just kind of share what I'm reading and what I think about it on Bread for Beggars. But I do really like writing fiction. Um, and I've dabbled a little bit in poetry and some other forms. But um, for the most part, I, I'm i a big reader. And that's what makes the, I don't know, that's what I, I, I like reading books and, and enjoying other people's writing. And then I haven't quite gotten to the point where I'm like confident enough in my own writing to necessarily be sharing a lot of the the fiction like i never really feel like it's finished um but yeah so um i've kind of been just getting started with bread for beggars but it's it's definitely the push that i need to be writing more consistently though i have been ignoring it the past few months i haven't written anything in a while <laughs> okay okay well maybe tell us a little bit about your personal life and why it is maybe that you sometimes are distracted from your writing hannah <laughs> yeah so um you may hear in the background, I have two little ones under two years old. Um, and I guess my oldest is turning three soon, so I won't be able to say the two, two, two and under thing for much longer. Um, but then I also run a small business where I um, design and sew gospel-centered baby books. It's called Even Song Baby Books. Um, and that's been a really fun way for me to meet other Christians and um, meet other people kind of in, a, in the maker or artist um, community. And that's been really fun for me. Uh, other than that, I occasionally read books, and I went to school to be an English teacher, but I currently just just read Winnie the Pooh um, the most <laughs> to my to my kids. So we, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of channeling my high school English teacher education into working with a very um, strong-willed two-year-old. <laughs> And I can attest to the fact that she's pretty strong-willed because, um, I, you know, part of our friendship is, um, you know, my wife and I, we've gotten to know you and your husband pretty well oh, yeah. over the years. And you guys have come and stayed at our house a few times. And I can definitely say that uh, you've got some some strong-willed little girls there. They are they're pretty cool. I really like them. Um, 
what I like them especially is that they're they're super adorable. And so when when you guys come over, I get to spend time with these really cute little girls, and then and then you guys leave, and I don't have to be the one to <laughs> to deal with with all of the the hard parts of parenting little little ones like that. Not that it wouldn't be a joy if they were mine, but you know what. <laughs> that Jared feels the same way about like getting to be counselor for your sons and then having <laughs> leave at the end of the week and go home. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he's experienced some rough times with my own kids as well, because <laughs> while my boys are quite a bit older that, you know, it's the challenges don't, don't go away. They just change. Yeah. So very cool. All right. Um, well, what I wanted to do to get us started, um, I thought we'd just share a story to start out with. And uh, I, I hope it's okay. I hope it, anybody watching it feels okay with this. If I just read a story, um, I'll read a story, and then and then Hannah, you can react to it, and then you'll read a story, and I'll react to it. We can talk a little bit, and then we'll talk for a while about the writing process and some of the things behind the creativity there, and then we'll kind of just go from there for the time being. Um, this is I'm going to read a story that I wrote called Love Barometer. <laughs> this is kind of a uh, I hope that doesn't, the title doesn't give away too much about this story, but hopefully it's not too heavy. If, I was kind of going over it a little bit earlier today and feeling like, wow, man, there's some weighty stuff in this one. But uh, when I get to the end, I want to talk a little bit about the ending. So, and anything else that Hannah, you want to talk about? Sure. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> she hangs up her coat, stares at it with a little crease between her eyebrows. Trembling hands pull an envelope from the coat, fold it, stuff it into the pocket of her skirt. Anna, says the receptionist. Where were you this morning? Appointment? Anna nods and hurries on. At her desk, she grabs a picture frame, scattering dust as she puts it face down. Her hand lingers. A lump forms in her throat. She thinks about seeing it all day. She thinks about not seeing it. She thinks about it being gone. Blinking back tears, Anna reaches instead for her to-do list. Focus, Anna, she says to herself. After all, says Marcy two hours later after lunch, it isn't as though you expected it to last forever. I mean, who does these days? The important thing is that I'm here for you, okay, Anna? Anna's fingers worry at the envelope in her pocket. Okay, she says, looking at the untouched food in front of her. The day ends with far too many things undone, and Anna just sighs, wondering why focus and emotion are such bad friends. While her computer shuts down, she opens the envelope, reads the slip, slip of paper again. Tears drip from her eyelashes as she blinks. What is it, dear? asks the kind old lady across the aisle on the bus. I know heartache when I see it. Would you care for a listening ear? I don't love my husband, Anna sobs. The old lady reaches over and pats her knee, lets it linger for several long minutes. Dinner is a fiasco. The nanny leaves supper unmade and the table unset, hurrying out of the apartment as she senses that all is not well. Anna, unprepared to finish up, serves cold spaghetti sauce with sticky noodles and the baby won't eat a bite. Halfway through supper, John asks, what's the matter? And she hands him the envelope. He paces around the room, cursing and ranting. The baby is crying and Anna sits on the couch, curled in on herself, her eyes puffy and red, but dry. She's too tired to cry anymore. Is he angry because of what's in the envelope? Angry at her for bringing it home, for getting it in the first place, angry at himself? She hears it all in his words, but she can't see the root. At last, John goes to bed. What do you want me to do, she asks. Do what you like, he snaps. Then more gently, maybe it would be better if you went and stayed with your granddad. Your granddad. Normally it's just granddad. Already the separation. She packs a small bag for herself and one for the baby. For a few moments, she considers leaving the boy in the apartment. She knows John wouldn't mind. She smiles a little, knowing that no matter what happens, John will always be a good dad. But she and the baby are used to their routine, and John likes to sleep in on Saturdays. So she puts the baby in his carrier and quietly closes and locks the apartment door behind her. The bus driver smiles at the baby, but looks away when he sees Anna's face. He doesn't make conversation. All right, then, says Granddad, once the baby is settled and Anna has a cup of hot cocoa. Let's hear what this is all about. She hands over the envelope. Oh, going to need my cheaters, he mumbles as he puts on his reading glasses. 
You know, sweetheart, he says after reading the paper several times, your grandma and I, we didn't have all this business. We didn't worry about things like this. He says this, flicking the paper and sending it skidding across the table. We just buckled down and did what we were supposed to do. We held on to each other and our promises. We didn't fret so much. Well, it's different now, says Anna, but it feels lame, lame coming out. I don't see why, says Granddad. He leaves the table and makes up the couch for her. Ever since he moved into the apartment in the city, he hasn't had a spare bed. He said once that it was good, because now that she's married, she shouldn't be coming back to him all the time. But she still does now and then. And he always makes up the couch with her favorite old blanket. She sleeps fitfully, and in the morning makes up her mind. Maybe Granddad is right, and maybe he's not. Maybe the test is as real as everyone says it is, but it doesn't matter. John means more. They have a life together, plans, a baby, maybe more babies someday. This is all just silly. I'm going to need to work myself up to facing him again, she says to Granddad over her coffee cup. He nods, says, then let's go to the park. Anna smiles as she watches him push the baby on the swings and hold him all the way down the slide. How similar Granddad and John are. She loves Granddad so much. Why doesn't she love John? I'm buying lunch, she says. Okay, says Granddad, but next one's on me. Once Granddad is back home, she and the baby ride the bus back to their own apartment. John, I have something I need to say, she says, barely setting the baby down first. Wait, Anna, me first, he says, holding up a hand. I want to show you something. See, I got an appointment today, and I went in. He hands her an envelope. Anna trembles. She can feel the world crumbling about her as she pulls out the slip of paper. Love assessment report, it reads. Findings. John Alfred Cohen for Anna Louise Cohen. Below threshold. Other details like the exact metric and the interpretation and phone numbers for legal specialists swim as tears well up. Don't you see, Anna? John's voice is far away and hollow. Yesterday I was mad because I thought I loved you. I foolishly believed you loved me too, and I was afraid what would happen to me once I knew the truth. But I see now that it's okay. But we can go our separate ways, and it'll be all right. We have some things to work out, you know, the custody and all, but it'll be okay now. Anna feels herself nodding, not knowing why. The words she had all she had been ready to say slipping away like the paper falling from her hand. She barely remembers turning and running out the door, retreating back to Granddad's house. She only knows the hot tears streaming down her face as she cries through the night on Granddad's couch. She doesn't understand why it hurts so much more now. Throughout the next day and night, Granddad takes good care of the baby, takes good care of Anna. But she can see the silent judgment in his eyes, the unspoken, are you really going to let this end just because of a stupid test? So at three in the morning, she stands on the fire escape outside the bedroom where she and John have spent so many precious nights. John wouldn't come to the door, and while she feels foolish like she's in a bad movie scene, she's done giving up. She stares through the window at the man sitting on the bed, looking heartsick and worn and beautiful and strong, and all she wants is to lean on him and feed off his strength. His eyes meet hers. He blinks in surprise, opens the window, but not the screen. I don't care what the test said. Her words come out in a rush. I don't care if you love me or not or if I love you or not. Do you really think that you can measure love on a machine? And even if you could, it doesn't matter. All that matters is us. It, it's all just crap, John. It's crap. All this we get fed every day about how we have to make sure we're really in love in order to find true happiness. And do you want to know how I know that? I know it because granddad and grandma weren't in love for most of their marriage. They just loved each other and they showed each other love no matter how they felt. And they didn't let a stupid machine tell them what to do. They just did it. And John, I'm so scared of losing you and I'm lonely and I just want to be with you and I can't let us go just because of some stupid test. And I'm so sorry, John. She breaks off into sobs. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I don't love you, but I want to love you. John stares at her through the screen for a very long time. And that's the end. Except, well, that's how the, I originally ended it. And then um, a couple years, like, well, three years later, I revisited this story. Like, I wrote this a long time ago. And then I revisited, and I was like, I just don't know if I should end it on this, like, uncertain note or if I should give it, like, a more hopeful ending. So do you want to hear, like, the other ending that I put on? Like, <laughs> All right. <laughs> so 
after that, then there's one more sentence, which just says, and later a bus carries a young couple across town to an old man's apartment to pick up a baby and another chance. Oh, cute ending. So, what do you think? React to it, Hannah. Um, so the I think I might have read this story of yours before, potentially. It's possible. Maybe. Um, but the the first thing that I think of when I think of like a, a test measuring, um, like a level of love or compatibility is, um, like when I was in high school, right around Valentine's Day, you'd always like fill out this quiz of all of your likes and dislikes, and they'd like rate your percentage of compatibility with dates. <sighs> Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of like a really strange real world version of what you like. I mean, obviously your story is, um, exaggerated, um, very, <laughs> <laughs> very dystopian in nature. Um, right. but like the fact that people do try to measure compatibility and online dating and things like that, it's really interesting to, to see this, this take on it. Um, but I really like the way that the story comes to emphasize um, love being more of an action than a feeling um, or more like loving an action and in truth being more important than feeling love in a deep way. Um, it's, it's a fun story. I like, it. I think you do a good job of diving into a lot of deeper emotions in a very short period of time. Sure. Especially because the, the, the story is pretty much conflict the whole time and like deep emotion and things like that, but it's, it still feels kind of lighthearted. Hmm. Yeah, I was, um, it was like when I, I remember writing it and having in my head this, um, you know, just juxtaposition between her, her home life at her own apartment versus mm -hmm. when she's with her granddad, where it's just like, there's this very comfortable, just this is, this is me as a little girl, mm -hmm. um, carefree and cared for. And then she goes to her own apartment and everything is just sort of like falling apart around her ears. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to kind of bring that that idea out. Um, I see a little comment on the side. Susan Fink, she said, very good writing as usual, Brandon. I like both endings. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate that. Um, I always appreciate Susan's encouragement. She's uh, she's not a bad writer herself. So maybe we should get her in this conversation next time. Um, well, so do you have a... Uh, a story to share with us? Oh, you're parenting. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, I do. It's not a story I've written. Um, okay. But it is a, a section from a book that I've been reading. Uh, okay. Because I, I don't have a lot of time to just sit, to sit down and write things. And I know that that's a pretty common excuse. But um, I do pretty consistently read. I listen to a lot of audiobooks while I take care of my kids. and um, So this is from... I've actually been reading through all of the Anne of Green Gables books, which are um, were some of my favorite books as a, a younger girl, but I've come back to them now and are, I'm reading through beyond just the initial story, which I hadn't done in the past. So this is like way far in the future. Um, it's the children of the original Anne and uh, they're experiencing kind of World War One. And I came to this book at a really unique time because we're, <clears throat> we're kind of dealing with a global crisis. And this was, I kind of read through all of these characters sort of experiencing the beginning of a global crisis. And I thought it was really interesting that I kind of came to this point in, in the series um, and watched kind of all the characters go from feeling, oh, I don't know about this. This might not affect us. It, it'll all blow over. And coming to a point of, oh man, this is really affecting hmm. Um So... I'm just going to share a bit of it and can chat about it. <laughs> so this is um, when the main character, this is from Rilla of Ingleside, and Rilla is the youngest daughter of Anne. Um, and this is when her older brother is, is right after the sinking of the Lusitania, he's being shipped off to, to war. So on his last evening at home, they went together to Rainbow Valley and sat down on the bank of the brook under the White Lady where the, the gay revels of olden days had been held in the cloudless years. Rainbow Valley was roofed over with a sunset of unusual splendor that night. A wonderful gray dusk just touched with starlight followed it. And then came moonshine, hinting, hiding, revealing, lighting up little dells and hollows here, leaving others in dark velvet shadow. 
When I am somewhere in France, said Walter, looking around him with eager eyes on the beauty his soul loved, I shall remember these still dewy moon-drenched places, the balsam of the fir trees, the peace of those white pools of moonshine, the strength of the hills. What a beautiful old biblical phrase that is. Rilla, look at these old hills around us, hills we looked up at as children, wondering what lay for us in the great world beyond them. How calm and strong they are, how patient and changeless, like the heart of a good woman. I could not have lived through it if it had not been for you, little loving believe, your little loving believing heart. Rilla dared not, Rilla dared not try to speak. She slipped her hand into Walter's and pressed it hard. And when I'm over there, Rilla, in that hell upon earth, which men who have forgotten God have made, it will be the thought of you that will help me most. I know you're as, you'll be as plucky and patient as you have shown yourself this past year. I'm not afraid for you. I know that no matter what happens, you'll be Rilla my Rilla, no matter what happens. This is just a reminder, they're siblings. Uh, they have a very close sibling relationship, but definitely if you didn't understand that context, you'd be thinking it was a romantic relationship. After a moment of silence in which each made an unworded promise to each other, he said, now we won't be sober anymore. We'll look beyond the years to the time when the war will be over and Jem and Jerry and I will come marching home and we'll all be happy again. We won't be happy in the same way, said Rilla. No, not in the same way. Nobody whom this war has touched will ever be happy again in quite the same way. But it will be a better happiness, I think, little sister, a happiness we've earned. We were very happy before, before the war, weren't we? With a home like Ingleside and a father and a mother like ours, we couldn't help but being happy. But that happiness was a gift from life and love. It wasn't really ours. Life could take it back at any time. I'm skipping over a little bit here, but <laughs> Walter came back with a long breath. He stood up and looked about him at the beautiful valley of moonlight as if to impress on his mind and heart every charm it possessed, the great plumes of the firs against the silvery sky, the stately white lady, the old magic of the dancing brook, the faithful tree lovers, the beckoning Trixie paths. I shall see it so in my dreams, he said as he turned away. They went back to Ingleside. Mr. and Mrs. Meredith were there with Gertrude Oliver, who had come from Lowbridge to say goodbye. Everybody was quite, quite cheerful and bright, but nobody said much about the war being soon over, as they had when Jem went away. They did not talk about the war at all, and they thought of nothing else. At last they gathered around the old piano and sang the grand old hymn, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. We all come back to God in these days of soul shifting, said Gertrude to John Meredith. There have been many days in the past when I didn't believe in God, not as God, only as the impersonal great first cause of the scientists. I believe in him now. I have to. There's nothing else to fall back on but God, humbly, starkly, unconditionally. Our help in ages past, the same yesterday, today, and forever, said the minister gently. When we forget God, he remembers us. So that's the section. Um, I don't know if you want to react to it. or. or yeah. Yeah. But well... I was really, really hooked in by like the description of, of the, the setting, the valley, the hills, yeah. the trees, all that stuff. Um, but what especially caught me was there was that line about that was kind of like a personification, mm -hmm. like these hills, patient and calm, sort of the idea that uh, they themselves have a personality and um, that's coming through. I, that, that was really cool. Um, yeah. I was trying to think of a word to describe that feeling like it, it wasn't nostalgia is not the right word for it, but it's that sort of like heavy wistfulness. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Wist yeah. yeah. These characters are also both coming of age at this point in the story. And they're both kind of experiencing the first conflict and the first difficulty in their lives they've ever had. And they're sitting in kind of this place that, was their childhood play space and, and they're reflecting on where they've been and how carefree those days were. And I, I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a heavy feeling, but they decide to kind of set the heaviness aside and like enjoy the wistfulness of the place where they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what it struck me as was um, the same feeling you get when um, you're about to move, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> something's yeah. about to change. And until it does, um, you know, you're, you, you, you want to capture every moment, but then once this happens now, um, you know, now th everything's going to be different. 
now that you say that, it's majorly relevant to my life. <laughs> We're like <laughs> right. moving right now. Um, and like with so many changes happening in the world, it, there's definitely kind of a strange feeling of the world kind of just moving on in, in the face of a major conflict, in the face of a major world crisis going on. Um, there's so much ordinary, I think, in, in the crazy things that are happening out in the world. Um, a few other things that I really enjoyed from this book specifically is there's this one character that used to never read the papers, used to never be involved in politics, but now she's like sitting on her porch knitting every day when the mailman comes to bring the paper. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of funny to see how um, through the, the eyes of this old lady who was, who was very, uh, I don't know, she was really crabby about the, the whole war thing starting. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, she starts to see it affect her life and she starts to see the way that um, I don't know. She, she, you kind of see the way that life used to be different in terms of information being constantly available now, and then it was people sat and they waited for the newspaper to come to hear what was going on in the rest of the world. Hmm. Um, it's definitely interesting to see kind of a similar situation, but um, in a different time and place. Yeah, we're not sitting on the porch waiting for the newspaper. We can just uh, no. open up our phone. But instead, now it's 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 hitting the refresh on your phone so that you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you want to get away from that too. Mm -hmm. I saw there was a comment. Uh, Micah left this just as you started reading. Um, Micah Parlo said uh, on my story, he he thinks the original ending, "Let a tragedy be a tragedy," leaves it open to a sequel. He said. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't know. Like, I, 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 when it comes to short stories, I always feel like, like there's a definite like danger in in trying too hard to follow it. You know, yeah. like short stories have to be like a slice, and um, I don't know. I've well, always enjoyed that most because it takes the least amount of time to write. Um, and <laughs> I don't have to like go through pages and pages and edit. I can just, I can just do one page and it's one and done. And there's kind of a way to, to pack a punch in, in like a short amount of space that takes a lot more thought and planning. I think when it's a, a longer work and I've never been good at the like planning ahead and then sitting down to write, I'd rather just sit it down and write and get it all out of my head at once. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> We used to do a thing, uh, Luke and I used to do this, where we would write what we called um, microfiction. And it was like each story had to be 200 words or less or something like that. Okay. And uh, it was it was a fun challenge because you had to try to come up with a very complete story and you had just such a small amount of text to work with. But Yeah, I did a fun lesson with some students once like that. It was... What's the Ernest Hemingway like two line story? The oh, never worn. The what is it? Um, yeah, it's for sale. Baby shoes sale. never yeah, worn. That's what it is. Yeah. The funny story behind that is that uh, he was he was in a bar drinking like Hemingway was most of the time, um, and <laughs> he was sitting with with some other guy who you know the, the, he was saying something about like you know the briefer the story the better and the guy said well you know obviously there's too short of a story and Hemingway goes, no, nah, I don't think so. And, and he says, well, well how, you know, how short is too short? And they start whittling it down and he gets down to 12 words. And the guy says, I bet you can't write a complete story in 12 words. And Hemingway just says, well, let's give it a try. He grabs a napkin, writes with a pen and he goes here, that's six. And it's like one of Hemingway's most like well-known yeah. things too, because it's so, yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's talk just a minute about um, la la what you were just saying. Um, sure. I want to talk about the difference between kind of the ins being inspired and the hard work. Um, what do you what do you think about that? Is right like writing good writing? Is that more inspiration, or is it more like down in? you know, the trenches slogging through things, which is it for you? <laughs> well, I mean, if I, if writing were just inspiration for me, then I would have a lot more things that are actually written and I would be sharing them right now. Um, <laughs> Cause I have all the ideas. I have like notebooks full of ideas of things I want to write. Um, 
but I think it's maybe not hard work so much as self-discipline um, and being able to be consistent and writing it into your schedule, things like that. Um, at least for me, I think some people might be like hit with a story in, in the shower or, or wake up and, and like need to write down an idea. Um, but I'm usually okay with just letting the idea sit there until there's like a need for the idea and then putting it out there. I've always been way better at writing if someone like assigns me something to write, uh, which is why most of my good writing was in college. But because <laughs> then there's actually pressure to, to make it something. Um, otherwise, I like to like, I have a lot of unfinished things that I kind of let, let sit. So, yeah, I would say as a creative, I'm totally an idea person. I like love coming up with new ideas, but I just write them down and, and then they stay there unless, unless there's a pressing need for them to become a, an actual story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of in the same place. I think that like, we like to think that, that good writing is going to be all inspiration. It's like, Oh, I have this flash, you know, flash of an idea, but then you actually start writing it down. And that's what usually is the hardest thing is taking an idea and actually turning it into something that's readable um, and putting your ideas into it. I, I think maybe just once or twice in my entire life, I've had kind of one of those moments where it was like, I had something inspire me and I just absolutely had to write it. Mm-hmm. And that was the first thing I did the next day. Um, that actually happened with, there was one story that we have on uh, Bread for Beggars that I wrote, uh, The Day It Rained Silver. That was one of those. I, it was a dream that I had. I, I actually dreamed that story, most of it. Um, and then I, I like, I woke up and I was like, ah, I gotta write this down. This is just like st- stuck in my head. And so I wrote it all down that, all in the morning. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's no, <laughs> <laughs> one time, like <laughs> just one time, <laughs> most every other story I've ever written took actual work, <laughs> like a lot of work. <laughs> um, but I want to train to go away from that for a little bit, transition into talking a little bit about the idea of um, what is like the intersection between faith and creativity. That is like, um, you know, we're called as Christians to be part of the kingdom and to build the kingdom. How does writing f- fictional stories help us to build the kingdom? How does that inv- advance things? Where does the gospel fit into that? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think there are a lot of people smarter than me who have a lot of really good ideas about that. Um, but I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. <laughs> but generally, my thought is that like the gospel itself can stand alone. It doesn't need me to write something to, to illuminate it more. Um, but I think being able to see other people's stories, um, either putting putting a story in new words or putting the gospel into like a different setting or letting it show up among different people is uh, maybe one of the, I don't know, that's, it exposes us to the kingdom in a new way, I guess. And it, it kind of allows us to, to fulfill our calling in a different way. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say it as well as any of the smart people. Um, but I, I think <laughs> it comes through, I guess it, it exposes us to different people's stories. Um, one of the things I, that led me to be, so interested in, in writing and in reading um, is I remember sitting in, in English class in, in high school and there were these completely non-religious works of fiction, but we were, I was sitting there with all kinds of people from different faiths and different backgrounds. And we all managed to have some kind of connection to this, to these pieces of writing. And we were able, I mean, I, I found Jesus in almost everything I read um, because I was looking, um, but other people found different ideas and different thoughts and being able to like have it, have, I don't know, have stories be kind of an intersection for all kinds of different people. Um, I mean, that is its own conduit for the gospel, I suppose. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people with really deep thoughts on this topic. And <laughs> I generally, I think, uh, it, it can be a really great way to advance the kingdom. I personally, I like am more drawn to writing for children at this phase in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, partly because my husband and I work with, with youth a little bit and we I have small children. Um, so definitely being able to convey the gospel to them in unique ways through stories makes it more tangible. But 
that's like maybe the more practical sense of like being able to, to turn a, what might've been maybe not a dry or boring Bible lesson, but, but something that's a little bit more intangible into something more tangible. That's easier for a younger mm -hmm. person to grasp. Yeah. Um, I think there's something to, to the idea that and you used the word calling earlier to kind of embracing the fact that we're made to reflect who God is, to reflect his character. Yeah. And in some, and in some way that means that if, um, if God is a creator and he's created us, you know, any one of us to be creative in some way, then when we tell good stories, we're really kind of being godlike in a way. Um, I, I think it, I think it, it's, is kind of reductive <laughs> to think that the only way to be yeah. like God is just to embody moral principles and, and not to you know, to do so. I mean, and we, we can talk about that, for instance, in terms of relationships I can say, all right, well, when I love my wife, well, that's me reflecting God's love to her. Mm -hmm. Obviously that that's part of being, you know, that's advancing the kingdom in its way. And so why can't uh, being a creator, the way that he is, a small C creator, you know, be also a way to advance the kingdom? And I think it is in a way. I also think there's something, I, uh, the term that I've heard people use is incarnative, to, to really to embody something, to bring something into being. And that there's a beauty to that as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I just think that there's a lot of value to it. For sure, yeah. And I, I think um, there's a <clears throat> there's there's so much good writing out there that's written by Christians or or for Christians. But um, I, I think I what I like to see is uh, the gospel being shown in in more understated ways. Um, mm -hmm. And there's like kind of the is allegory the best way to do it? Is it not the best way to do it? You, you know, like the the Tolkien Lewis mm -hmm. controversy kind of thing. Um, but Generally, I think when when I write, I like to I like to I guess shed light on truth in more understated ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's tricky, I think, to find that balance between like high level high level thinking and um, being approachable and relatable, and then not being too cheesy. There's, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of a lot of Christian fiction out there that's maybe a little bit cheesy. <laughs> Well, that makes me think of like um, when when I was younger, when I was like a teenager, or young adult, uh, I used to go to Christian bookstores all the time. And it was like, at least at that point in time, kind of late 2000s or, or I mean, not late 2000s, uh, early, late 90s, early 2000s, um, you went into a Christian bookstore. There was no such thing as Christian fiction that wasn't synonymous with Amish romance. Oh, man. So it was... I'm bring this up. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, we can't really talk about Christian fiction without mentioning Amish romance at some point. Right. right. But <laughs> but it, I mean, it was like there was no good Christian storytelling apart from that genre. Yeah. And it was almost like everything that was written had to be super on the nose, too. And like kind of preachy in a sense. Mm -hmm. And what about just the idea of just telling a good story? And it kind of gets to that idea that uh, Luther had when he talked about a shoemaker doesn't glorify God by putting little crosses on the shoes. He glorifies God by just making the best shoes he can. So to me, um, if I've been wired to be a storyteller, then I glorify God just by telling a really good story because people like to read good stories. There are great stories out there. People are going to read them anyway. I would rather, um, you know, as a Christian, let my values be reflected in those stories. than somebody read something that's maybe reflecting values that are, sure. that, that are going to lead them away from Christ. Um, that's why I think that I prefer that when I think about guys like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Brent Weeks. Have you and I talked about Brent Weeks before? Maybe a little bit. So he's a Christian author whose books are almost, almost game of Thrones, maybe not quite in the, mm -hmm. the the level of kind of uh, mature content so much as just, sure. um, you know, it's it's a little gritty and it's very real. Mm -hmm. It's kind of real fantasy. Mm -hmm. And yet his Christian perspective shines through at certain points to the extent that actually people who aren't Christian don't like his stories because they don't get it. <laughs> they're like, they're, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand why this is the way it is. And I'm like, yeah, that's because you're not a Christian. The man without the spirit doesn't understand the things that come from the spirit. Yeah. Um, yeah. so
I don't know. We're uh, we're at about forty minutes, Hannah. I think we're gonna yeah. gonna maybe wrap it up here and save the rest of what we kind of planned out to talk about for another session, maybe, or uh, yeah, we'll figure something else out. But uh, can I share with you before we go just like a really really short story that I really wanted to share because I found it and I was like, this is like one of the dumbest stories I've ever written, but it also yeah. like makes me smile every time I come across it. So. Go for it. All right. This is one of those uh, less than 200 word stories. Uh, the main character, by the way, is a guy named Gravy, but don't think like the kind of gravy you pour on your, it's it's G-R-A-Y-V-E-Y. So it's like gravy. Okay, anyway, whatever. <laughs> this is it. This is really it, Gravy said to no one in particular. Eagerly, he spun the dial back randomly. 140,000 years ought to be enough for a start, he mused. Stepping into his patented temporal redistribution device, Time Machine was so passe. He rubbed his hands in excitement at the thought of seeing the world before human history. And then he was standing in a room. Gray walls surrounded him. Three beings, in appearance as men, sat in chairs and looked on him without surprise. You are really not supposed to be here, said the one in the middle. And then Gravy was no more. <laughs> I don't know why it makes me laugh at myself so much every time I read that, but I just, <laughs> there's something funny about that to me. I just love the idea of some guy going back in time to like, there's nothing here except somebody that he wasn't expecting. That's so fun. I like it. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, See, so no questions from the uh, the peanut gallery or anything. I'm just going to say thanks for uh, joining us for this little bit of writer's corner. I think we'll plan to do this again as long as yep. people enjoyed it well enough to tune in. And uh, Hannah, thanks for talking with me tonight. It was nice to see you. It's been too long since we got to sit together across a table and play a board game and talk about this stuff. So, it's yeah. Someday. Someday. We'll see when... Uh, when we all feel good about it. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thanks for joining us, everybody.